In 1912, Jim Thorpe arrived at the Olympic Games and stunned the world. He was the greatest athlete anyone had ever seen. Soon, Jim Thorpe was a name people knew around the world. But Jim Thorpe had another name, one his parents gave him in his native language. The name was Wa Thohuk, which means Bright Path. As an indigenous person, Jim faced discrimination throughout his life. Strong and honest, he persevered. Jim Thorpe would show the world the strength of his culture at a time when the U.S. government wanted to erase it. His bright path in life would be filled with hardship, but also light. This is the story of Jim Thorpe, the first Native American to bring home gold for the United States. historians, welcome to another episode of Anytime Now. I'm Brooke, co-founder of Honest History. Do you love cheering for athletes competing in the Olympics? It's always an amazing time to watch the spirit of friendly competition between athletes as countries from around the world come together and try to win gold. In this episode, we get to learn about one of these athletes and his incredible performance in the 1912 Olympic Games. But we also get to learn more about his life as a Native American and the challenges he overcame to get to the Olympics in the first place. It's time to head back over a hundred years ago, where our story begins in Oklahoma. Are you ready? Our story begins in 1895. Jim Thorpe walked out the front door of his home and ran towards the river in the distance. He was seven years old. His family home was made of wood and sat on the Sac and Fox Reservation near Belmont, Oklahoma. The river nearby is called the Canadian River. This was where Jim and his siblings swam. Below his house, there were green pastures where his father trained horses. Jim and his family also had cows, chickens, and pigs. They grew corn, beans, and melons, and ate rabbit, turkey, chicken, deer, and squirrel. Fried squirrel, as it happens, was one of Jim's favorite meals. Mm. Jim Thorpe was grandson of the great war chief Black Hawk. His parents, Hiram and Charlotte, were both half indigenous and half white. They raised Jim and his siblings on this land where he learned the ways of his Sac and Fox ancestors. After playing by the river, Jim and his twin brother Charlie raced up to their favorite tree. Our favorite stunt was to climb to the top of a tall tree that would bend and sway under our weight, swing there, and then leap to the ground, Jim remembered. He loved playing outside. The boy's life, however, was about to change. Later that year, they would be leaving home and going to the Sac and Fox boarding school. This school was run by the U.S. government. At this time, indigenous children were forced to attend schools called Indian boarding schools. For a full year, children lived away from their families, only allowed to return home during the summer. Jim and Charlie arrived for the first day of school wearing their new, uncomfortable school uniforms, a suit and top hat. As soon as they entered the school doors, it became clear that life would be very different. Jim was not allowed to speak his native language, Fakua, even to his brother. From now on, only English. The teachers were strict and Jim found the lessons to be boring. He did not like being trapped inside for hours. It was at this school that Jim lost his twin brother, Charlie. A deadly illness called typhoid fever spread at school and Charlie became very ill. Sadly, he did not survive. Without Charlie, Jim had an even harder time at school. He wanted to escape. Jim began running away from school. Jim's father tried sending Jim to a new school called Haskell Institute in Kansas. At this school, Jim studied mathematics, reading, and writing. But most importantly, this was where he learned about football. It was at Haskell I saw my first football game and developed a love for it. A love I have had through the years. Jim remembered. Jim was still too young to play for the school's team, but he had an idea. He decided to make a football team of his own with his classmates. 
They played after classes on the outskirts of the campus. We fashioned a football from wool yarn, Jim said. Life had been very hard with his twin brother, Charlie, but now Jim could see a future for himself. He dreamt of becoming an athlete. When Jim turned 16 years old, he began attending another school in Pennsylvania. It was called Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Unlike his old school, Carlisle had students from all over the country. Like other Indian boarding schools, Carlisle was created by the U.S. government with one thing in mind. It wanted to erase indigenous culture. The students were forced to cut their hair, wear military uniforms, speak only English, and change their religion. Carlisle also had a powerful football team, and they were looking for the next great athlete. It was here that Jim Thorpe began his athletic career. One day, Jim walked by the track where the Carlisle athletes were training. He watched students running towards a high jump. They leapt up into the air, trying to jump over a bar, but none of them were able to do it. Jim walked over and asked to give it a go. He ran, jumped up at the last moment, and flew over the bar. Easy. News of his jump spread to the school's track coach, Pop Warner. Pop called Thorpe into his office. You've, uh, broken the school record in the high jump. The very next day, Jim Thorpe was on the track team. And a few months later, he was the star on the football team. It was clear Jim was an incredible athlete. He could run fast, jump high, and throw far. Soon, he was playing for a professional baseball team. To Jim, it seemed like a dream come true. He got paid, though not very much, to do something he loved. Play baseball. Two years later, in 1912, Jim's career really began to take off. That was the year he landed himself a spot on the U.S. Olympic team. It was June 14, 1912. Jim Thorpe and 173 other athletes, dressed in blue blazers, marched towards the pier in New York City. Crowds lined the streets, clapping and waving American flags. Jim boarded the steamship, already packed with people. Athletes, families, friends, news reporters, and photographers filled the deck. Finally, the ship pulled out into the river and began its journey across the ocean to the Olympics Games. They were going to Stockholm, Sweden. Hi, young historians. Time for a quick break from this amazing story to tell you a bit more about honest history. If you're enjoying this episode, then you'll love Honest Histories, magazines, and books. Each one is filled with important adventures through the past, like the story of Chen Yi Sao, a Chinese woman who commanded one of the largest pirate fleets in history, to Mansa Musa from Africa, one of the wealthiest people to ever live. You can pick up a copy or subscribe and receive three issues delivered straight to your doorstep every three months. Just go to honesthistory.co and use code anytime now for a 10% discount. That's honesthistory.co and special promo code anytime now. Okay, let's get back to the story. Finally, after many days of travel, the ship pulled into Stockholm Harbor. Jim spent the days leading up the games, practicing and preparing. He had a special way of training. He didn't just go out and jump over a high jump. He sat and thought about jumping over that bar first. He would visualize what he wanted to do. If he could see it in his mind, he knew he could do it. The Olympics games began on a sunny, clear day. That weekend, under the blue skies, Jim had his first event, the pentathlon. In 1912, this event involved running, jumping, discus throwing, and javelin throwing. Jim sped past his competitors in the first sprint of the pentathlon. He leapt past the other athletes in the long jump. Then he launched a discus over 116 feet, farther than anyone else. For the next event, he took the javelin in his hand. This was an event he rarely practiced and hurled it over 150 feet. He came third in the javelin throwing. 
Not bad for someone who didn't practice. Finally, in the last event of the pentathlon, he ran 1,500 meters and finished in first place. The newspapers printed the exciting news. Jim Thorpe had won a gold medal for the United States. For some, it came as a shock. The newspapers hadn't predicted Jim Thorpe would be an Olympian. They had underestimated him, but Jim never underestimated himself. At no time during the competitions was I worried or nervous as to the outcome. I had trained well and hard and had the confidence in my ability. I felt that I would win. Jim's next event was the grueling decathlon. This competition happened over three days with 10 different events. On the first day of the decathlon, the clear blue skies turned dark gray. It began pouring rain. The crowds watched from under umbrellas as the 29 athletes raced and slid on the wet ground. Jim came second in the first race and third in the long jump. Thankfully, on the second day, the clouds cleared and the sun shone brightly in the sky. Jim was relieved the rain had disappeared and prepared for his next event. But that morning, he had a problem. He couldn't find his shoes. Jim and his coach, Pop Warner, searched for anything he could use. They finally put together a pair. The shoes were different sizes and didn't fit very well. But they would have to do. Pop threw some cleats onto the shoes and hoped for the best. Jim laced up his mismatched shoes and calmly stepped onto the field. He stared at the bar in front of him, visualizing jumping over it. Then, he ran towards the bar and leapt off the ground, throwing his body over six feet into the air. That was high enough to qualify for the next event. Now, there were only 18 men and six events left. By the last event, Jim was so far ahead of his competitors, there was no question who would win. As Jim crossed the finish line, the crowd whistled and roared with excitement. He had won another gold medal for the United States of America. When Jim arrived back in the United States, he was overwhelmed by the attention. Wherever he went, crowds of people jostled to see him. In New York, there was an Olympic victory parade where the athletes sat in cars as they drove through the streets. Jim was placed in the front car. He could hear the chants of children shouting his name as he drove past. Suddenly, all kinds of coaches were sending Jim letters asking him to join their team. Football coaches, baseball coaches, and even ice hockey coaches wanted the famous athlete at their side. Even the US president, William Taft, knew his name. President Taft gave a speech declaring Jim Thorpe had all the qualities of the best type of American citizen. This was ironic because, at that time, the government did not consider American Indian citizens. Jim Thorpe was a celebrity now, but six months later, his career was suddenly on the line. It was a day he would never forget. In January of 1913, Jim had just spent the winter holidays back home with his friends. When he returned to Pennsylvania, he was given terrible news. There, in a newspaper, printed in black and white, was a story about him. And it wasn't a good story. That the great Jim Thorpe, world's amateur champion athlete, played professional baseball in the Carolina Association for two years, is the statement made by Charles Clancy. The newspaper said. It was true. Jim had played professional baseball before the Olympics. But what was so wrong with that? As it turns out, it's against the rules for the Olympic athletes to play professionally. What did this mean? Well, it meant that his medals might be taken away. Jim was confused. Many other athletes had played professionally before the Olympics. Why were his medals in danger? The problem was the other athletes often competed professionally using fake names. When Jim played baseball, he used his real name. Jim wanted to be honest, as he always had been. Knowing what would happen, he told the truth. He had played professional baseball. After that, the Olympic Committee took away the trophies and his gold medals. Some newspapers praised the committee's decision, but many others believed it was unfair. 
countless white athletes had played professionally, and yet they were allowed to compete in the Olympics. With or without the gold medals, it was clear Jim Thorpe was the real champion. Even when his Olympic medals were stolen, Jim hoped they would be returned someday. I won them, and I know I won them, he said. Throughout his life, Jim Thorpe faced many hardships, but there is one thing that made him truly incredible. He never gave up. After the Olympics, Jim went on to have a successful athletic career. He played baseball for the New York Giants and played professional football. Finally, in 2022, over 100 years after Jim Thorpe won the pentathlon and decathlon, the International Olympic Committee restored his Olympic medals. It took over a century for the committee to finally right that wrong. Today, Jim Thorpe remains one of the greatest athletes in history. He was the first Native American to win a gold medal for the United States. And he did this at a time when Native Americans were discriminated against. His perseverance showed the strength of his culture, not just to the United States, but to the entire world. Welcome back. If this story made you want to go watch some Olympic sports, we're right there with you. What an incredible story of a champion who overcame obstacles to become one of America's greatest athletes to ever live. That's all for now, but if you want to learn more about stories of Native people, be sure to check out issue 15 of Honest History Magazine, A Native Story. It's written and illustrated by Native people, and you'll learn all about Indigenous history, culture, and traditions. See you all next time! This episode was hosted by Allie McKnight and written by Heidi Coburn. Allie is a Native American artist, so be sure to go check out her incredible work. Production was led by Randall Lawrence. To learn more about this episode, including more about the host, visit us at honesthistory.co and follow along for updates on social media at Honest History. When you think about history, are there lots of old guys wearing wigs and stockings? When you think about history, is Napoleon really short? And folks have wooden teeth. Do you know that history can be the most incredible, amazing stories for you and me? Sit back and listen to a story right now. It's honest, it's fun, and it's sure to. Ah!